Good morning and welcome to everyone to this session of um, the Urban Art Research Conference. Um, my name is Gautam Bhan. I'm faculty here at the Indian Institute of Human Settlements, and it is my pleasure to be chairing this session today. Um, I will get straight into it because we have a packed panel and I want to give time to the panelists uh, more than anything else. And so I'll keep my comments for later. Um, what I would only like to say is to say about the provocation that led us to have this session, which is to think about the social as a mode of production of the urban, as important as the spatial, the material, the economic. I think that in many ways, we think of the social as something that happens in the city, as opposed to something that is the city. And it is this distinction from thinking about the social not as located in the urban, but as the urban itself, um, as something that is definitional of the urban as much as its built environment, as much as an infrastructure network, as much as its place as an economic geography, um, to think of it equivalently. And what would it mean if we took the city, the urban, the production of the urban, including its space and not just its culture, as the disciplinary and methodological and ethical motivation to think socially about the urban. What does it give us um, when we enter it through this way with equal importance? So I'm thrilled that this panel is here. It's not just about identity at all. It is very much about rethinking the urban through a fundamental entry point that takes the social seriously as something that affects all aspects of what we understand as the urban. So I'm going to go straight into the panelists and ask our first panelist, Indiva Jonalagada, to begin his presentation. Um, and I will keep, uh, again, the, ask the panelists to um, introduce the title uh, themselves. Uh, and briefly, if you would like to introduce themselves, just to maximize time, since this is the largest panel in this conference, which itself is a good sign. Over to you, Indiva. Thanks so much, Gautam, and thank you to the conference team for selecting my paper. My title is After Land Titling, Useless Land Titles and Suburban Citizenship in Hyderabad. I will also <laughs> jump right into it. Um, in this paper, I focus on a non-transferable property title commonly referred to simply as patta that is routinely granted to some households in urban India. The specialty of this title is its multiple restrictions and conditionalities. Crucially, though it attests private property right over a piece of land, it prohibits the transfer of this property. Um, just a second, I'm sorry. Right. Um, okay, so, in June 2015, the government of the newly formed state of Telangana celebrated the first anniversary of the new state with grandeur at the iconic tank bund at the heart of Hyderabad city. The day was also marked by an array of spectacular gestures of gift giving by the state government to the urban and rural poor. Prominent among these spectacles was the culmination of six months of bureaucratic wrangling that resulted in 125,000 poor households across the state receiving land titles. Of these 12,000 households were in Hyderabad district alone. State-sponsored newspapers such as Namaste Telangana announced that this was the gateway to prosperity for the poor. The state government described this gesture as a sign of its pro-poor credentials and fieldwork contacts closer to the ground told me that there were grand celebrations in those slum areas where people had received titles. In the following days, I visited a small sun settlement not far from the site of the spectacle at Tank Pan called Mysamabanda. Merely a week after the aforementioned celebrations, I found a quiet resentment among those who received the title. A local activist in this area, Yunus, told me, yes, we were jubilant the day we got the titles, but the next morning we read the conditions that were written on the back. While no property right is unconditional, the conditions of the patta deserve special analysis for the way in which they are legally differentiated from other kinds of private property rights in Indian cities, which leads me to classify them as conditional as opposed to clear property rights. I conducted my, my research to investigate the social life and value of these titles for beneficiaries in Hyderabad. Although there have been multiple rounds of titling in Hyderabad slums starting in the 1970s, 
and a large program as recently as 2015, there's little quantitative data, let alone ethnographic description of their effects over time or even at any given moment. In what follows, I'll draw on interviews and ethnographic observations to not only interpret the conditions legally, but also to illustrate the tacit contextual and social lives of the Patta's conditionalities. And in the interest of time, I'll focus on just two of these many conditions. No transfer, that the, that the assigned land is only heritable. In June 2015, when I met Yunus and others in my Samabanda, after they had more carefully read the wording of the conditional title, they expressed feeling a deep sense of betrayal and insecurity. A group of them approached the revenue office for their division to ask what the non-transferability condition is supposed to mean and how it was practical. Yunus told me that Tessildar said, you should be happy with what you've received. But Yunus asked the Tessildar, but what is there to be happy about? And he said to me, they've swept the ground from under us. What are we supposed to do in moments of need for a daughter's wedding or in a health emergency? This piece of land is all we have. Weren't we better off without the patta? Notwithstanding Yunus's dismay at the conditionalities in the year 2015, the clause was not newly introduced. In fact, it has been the invariable approach to land titling in slums in India since the 1950s. Even outside the slum context, as Brenna Bhandar's work has shown, non-transferable titles have a long history in India and other colonial contexts where racial regimes of ownership were created to differentiate citizenship for groups seen as being unworthy of or incapable of bearing clear property rights. In the context of South India, Rupa Vishwanath has powerfully shown that this modality of titling emerged out of a nexus between caste elites and the colonial state to legally re-inscribe the political subordination of Dalit landless laborers. In the contemporary context, conditional titles are not explicitly tied to caste, but they propagate the work of subordination on the basis of anodyne governmental categories such as economically weak sections, or below poverty line. These categories ostensibly have an economic and functional basis, although from endless repetition in bureaucratic practice as Akhil Gupta has shown, they're still heavily determined by notions of caste. For example, one uh, revenue officer said candidly to me, the problem with core cities is that people there have no sense. Slums have such narrow roads and so little space for everyone and people crowd in there. What is the point of giving titles to people like that? Even as these new categories erode the restorative justice oriented aspects of protected categories such as SC and ST, they are mobilized in bureaucratic and political practice in registers which are imbued with social stereotypes about inferior capacities and capabilities for personhood and citizenship. By discounting the economic lives of the poor in this way, or circumscribing them within a paternalistic welfare system, the state relegates them from formal participation in land markets, but also creates the paradoxical situation where protected groups are forced to participate in unregulated markets, thus putting them at much greater risk. A situation that's aggra aggravated by exclusion from finance markets, as I described next. Condition four, that the occupant is entitled to obtain loan or mortgage. Now in the NSB Nagar area of an, an area called SPR Hills, I met Carmela, an English teacher in a reputed private school, a young Dalit Christian woman with cosmopolitan aspirations. We were drinking tea in her family's home with beautiful granite floors and pleasing new wall paint. Carmela's father Prabhakar, who's had a lifelong career as a factory worker, proudly said that it was his daughters that paid for all the renovations. Carmela accepted the praise solemnly. When I asked if she got a loan from a bank based on the mortgageability of the patta, she scoffed and said, that patta is a useless piece of paper. I took it to the bank. They looked at it and said, we cannot give loans to you. All of the, uh, although one of the major purported virtues of these titles is their mortgageability, one is unlikely to find a person who has successfully mortgaged such land to a formal financial institution. This incidentally has been a problem from the outset of such policies in the 1980s. For example, 
Uh, and an impact assessment study conducted in 1990 mentions that among 5,463 slum households they surveyed, from hearsay, they learned of just one person who actually acquired a formal loan. In this slide, it made sense that I often heard people dismiss the question of rights and talk about concrete support in terms of money or other materials. In SVR Hills, Balaram tells me, we don't want pattas, we want a slab roof. For that, we need their support. Support is a local and commonplace understanding of what the government should do to help the poor. Another SPR Hills resident, Narayana, clarifies, we don't want more land, we don't want flats, we just want to live a better life here. The government knows they should give us support to improve our lives, but they don't. They just need to give us money, we'll pay it back sincerely. We are, we are, we'll work hard, we're hard workers, but we just need support. This interest in loans or cash transfers from the state are often framed as a relationship of dependency between the state and the poor, building on a long tradition of scholarship that has critiqued welfare apparatuses as instruments for regulating the poor. I suggest that this frame is inadequate if the relationship between state and poor citizens is understood in its context of aspiration and striving for economic mobility, which even among the poor uh, is credit driven, although entirely outside the formally regulated market. When Balram was describing to me how his house evolved from a thatched hut to a two room unit with cement walls, I asked him, did you buy, did you borrow money to build these walls? He looked at me incredulously and also at his neighbor who was present at this conversation. They exchanged a laugh and Balaram said, of course I borrowed money. Where else would I get money from? I earn daily wages. This brings me to my concluding remarks. In this paper, I focused on the conditionalities of the title and its everyday ramifications for slum dwellers in Hyderabad to show the tactical orientations that people have to the patta as an instrument that is both for and against the aspirations of growth, orientations which hardly amount to gratitude to the government. As bureaucrats expect, or as the Chief Minister KCR has often proclaimed, they are. Contrary to being a right that expands freedoms and capabilities, either in terms of direct access to resources or access to opportunities, the Patta is experienced as a disabling but necessary legal relationship to the state and to markets. This is not to completely disqualify or devalorize the processes of titling, as attested by a vast literature, processes of titling and their contribution to tenure security in both legal and political registers is crucial to the politics of citizenship among some populations. Um, however, in this presentation, I've shown snapshots of what this politics looks like after titling. The legal anatomy of this differentiation is especially salient when it is understood as being the context for aspirational subaltern politics, which is invested in questions of civility and property, as Surya Kant Vagmore has shown. This analysis leads me to two key observations on the emergent politics of subaltern citizenship among slum residents that push beyond binaries of prominent urban studies frameworks. Firstly, contrary to being a state of exception to regulatory governance, I show that subaltern citizenship relies on rule-based modalities of managing marginalized populations. And secondly, and building on the first, subaltern citizenship as a framework troubles the neat binaries of informal versus formal or legal versus extra legal. Instead of positing two dichotomous streams, it reveals that what appears as a binary is the differential outcome of the same structural, legal, and social categories. These categories determine whose attempts at assembling legitimacy are successful and whose are only precariously and occasionally accomplished. Thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much Indira, um, for, for getting us off to that start um, in such a precise way in that limited period of time. I'm, I'm going to, while our next speaker set up, I'm going to leave a question for you as, um, as, as the opening one and a reminder to participants that the Q&A box is now open. So please feel free to begin to enter your questions in. And uh, Indiva, the, the reflection I wanted to hear from you was 
on this very interesting parallel you drew between welfare-based cash transfers as having been critiqued as a regulation of the poor, right? A management, a disciplining of the poor. And we know this literature very well, in, in, especially in the Latin American context. But to actually sort of titling has often been placed in terms of the agency of the poor. And what you're really doing is reversing and challenging that framework of speaking of titling, you called it a reinscription of the poor in space, right? A reinscription, literally a spatial inscription of rights only here and in this way. Can you, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more then about this question of how one reads the intent of distributive um, state policies for distributive justice, like titling or cash transfers. How does one read sort of the intended and unintended ways it looks upon the agency of the poor versus regulating and disciplining the poor, right? How do we, because what you're pushing for is saying that looking at it from the perspective, you know, and building on Surya Kant Wagner's argument of civility and property, that financial transfers could actually be a way in which the agency of particular citizens, particularly non-dominant identity citizens, could be increased instead of regulated, which would flip a lot of the reading on cash transfers. So I'd love to hear more about this, this idea of, of thinking of what builds on agency and what is actually this regular, that, that word, I mean, the inadequacy of the word welfare is quite evident now in this. So just think a little bit about that as we come back. Um, our next speakers are Andrew D'Souza and Bhagavanidhi M, um, who are presenting their work on caste in peripheral Bangalore. Andrew and Nidhi, over to you. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Um, I'm Andrew, my partner is Bhagavanidhi. I'll be taking you through the presentation, but both of us will be here for the Q&A and any other sessions. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna move really quickly through the initial parts and through any background, and I'm gonna try and focus a little more on the finding. Um, but really, our research is trying to look at, um, it asks a very uh, central question, which is what happens to caste and other kinds of social structures in the transformation to urbanization, right? So really, we want to look at this transformation that's happening from the rural to the urban between these two uh, binaries, so to speak. But we want to look at how it's happening. And we are using two of these anchoring concepts in order to do it. One of these is the peri-urban. And... Um, we believe that the peri-urban is a really powerful tool because it lets you look at um, sort of transformations happening in social and economic structures before they're fully completed or before they fully reach their urban forms in one sense. And um, there are areas that are under really rapid transformation. Um, and you can get an insight into these transformations while they're still happening. And one of the transformations is in caste. And really one of the thrusts of our research is to suggest that caste is much more than um, a, an added aspect of identity. It's really a major determinant of urbanization in India and in South Asia more generally. Um, it shapes land ownership most prominently, but also it shapes political power, social networks, um, economic capital. And the way that these two concepts interact is because so much of peri-urbanization is happening in formerly agricultural land, these agrarian caste relations become really defining factors of how our new urban spaces become uh, are formed. So just to clarify what we mean a little bit by peri-urbanization, um, there's been a lot of research recently on the topic and the idea, and there's been a move towards more concept-based definitions rather than geographic ones. So we're not calling the peri-urban simply um, the peripheries of large settlements, but really we're looking at a set of characteristics that are common to many of these places. Things like a really intense land use change from agricultural to residential and industrial and commercial purposes. Really heterogeneous uh, populations are beginning to pop up, which is also creating a lot of um, strain on existing natural resources. And importantly, a lot of diversity in occupation is something that we begin to see in these spaces. But yeah, like I said, it makes it possible to see the effects of urbanizations before they're fully developed. And we believe that it makes it possible to draw analogies between uh, so-called rural and so-called urban forms of, um, so of the same social structure, in particular caste. And like I said, not only does it determine land ownership, but we think it also determines uh, habitat. That is the kind of um, where people live, uh, what kind of uh, housing they have access to, what kind of social spaces they have access to, what kind of life worlds they are able to live. Um, it also shapes access to capital, to finance, to education and to social mobility more generally, as well as cultural power. 
So what we are suggesting here is that urbanization uh, sort of brings into focus, into relief, caste relations that already exist. Um, it strengthens some, it weakens others, not only the groups, but also the relations between uh, different groups. And although it does fracture uh, land and property regimes that are already existing, uh, the way that the consequences and the development of urbanization flows tends to happen along lines that have already been drawn um, by these cast, by these existing caste structures. Yeah. So I'll, our methods use a number of different uh, tools. Uh, we started with a set of villages that were incorporated uh, into the BBMP. We tried to get a good mix of um, large, small, and medium-sized villages, and we used a percentage of SC population as a proxy for caste structure. Um, we conducted a lot of uh, qualitative fieldwork, in-depth interviews, uh, focus group discussions, etc. And we really tried to build up a narrative of what had happened in these six settlements over the last few decades. Um, so something that we saw common to most of these uh, settlements was um, most had a central residential area uh, where the people's houses were and they were surrounded by agricultural land. Uh, within the central residential area, caste groups would usually inhabit their own areas or streets. Um, there was some amount of separation between them. Uh, whereas Dalit caste tended to live in the Cheri, either at the periphery or on the outskirts of the main settlement or at some distance from them. Um, but the main economic activity that was there in these settlements was usually agriculture. Um, although most of the land that was owned was owned by a few landowning castes. Uh, in particular, in South Bangalore, this was the Gauda and the Reddy subcaste. Um, Dalit workers tended to work as agricultural or domestic workers on the farms and homes of these landowning groups. Um, although they did own some amount of land themselves, a lot of this was uh, slowly lost over time uh, through uh, debt traps or through coercion or through other means and um, left most uh, agricultural land in the hand of uh, relatively few um, families and groups. Importantly, within the residential site itself was uh, what's known as uh, one important effect of the land reforms that had happened under the Devrajaras government was that the social welfare minister of the time had enabled um, land titling to many Dalit families. So they, what's known as in what's known as free sites, they had a lot of housing security to the houses that they were living on. They had tenure and they had a good legal um, titles over that land which we'll see it becomes important later. Now in this transformation that occurred since the incorporation, one thing that really happened is that the land concentration really accelerated. So existing landowners were able to consolidate their holdings and um, amass really large amounts of land, which were then sold to uh, infrastructure, to the BDA, uh, to real estate, and uh, which resulted in a huge windfall for the landowning caste families. Um, the residential part of the settlement also saw amount, some amount of development, not just the agricultural. Uh, the most dramatic did happen in the agricultural land. Uh, meanwhile, most of this was happening, the Dalit families in the settlement were usually left out of this entire process. Um, since most of their agricultural land had been lost, what little they did have was also eventually lost, either for extremely poor compensation or was in one way or another apprised from their hands. And... The cherries where they were living was also excluded from this new land market, this huge uh, boom in speculation and um, real estate pricing. Largely, this was a result of caste notions. Um, caste Hindus don't want to live in the cherry, and as a result, there was little demand for it, although the lack of demand was also in a way artificial. Um, they were rarely offered the same prices that were um, being seen in the other parts of the settlement. As a result, they ended up developing the worst infrastructure, uh, really poor roads, a lack of sanitation. And although they had um, act, uh, security over their housing, the tenure that they had also in a way tied their identity down to the chain, which began a kind of vicious circle where the, ident the caste identity became tied into that settlement. And as a result, it further excluded them from any uh, speculation or real estate developments that ended up happening. But there were a number of uh, socioeconomic transformations. Perhaps the most important was the breakage of the sort of feudal dependency relation uh, that we had seen before. Most Dalit residents moved towards wage labor um, and moved away from that kind of uh, serfdom. 
but they were still unable to access things that would have really propelled them beyond that so they were unable to access capital they were able to start businesses to open their own shops largely due to their identity and the cherry itself still was tied to a kind of dalit identity but the physical mobility that urbanization brought in the form of roads and other infrastructure did allow a certain a certain amount of shedding of caste identity and um, interpersonal discrimination we saw had reduced but really not in uh, some of the more material ways or the more ritual ways so really what we see is a kind of divergence in the trajectories of different groups uh, within the settlement um not to say that they were on the same trajectory before but this really amplified their difference so we land owners land owning caste saw a huge increase in wealth and a kind of liquefaction of their capital in a sense whereas um, dalit families really saw an increase in income and a move to a different kind of occupation a more independent but um, it's still without the kind of uh, financial or social capital to be um, to, to truly become uh, socially mobile so the benefits that urbanization and this new land boom did bring tended to fall along the lines that already exist um, so while these new circuits of capital now became accessible for large land owning castes um, the only thing that became accessible for dalit families were new forms of work and identity which is important but it's not the same kind of uh, transformation that we see for land owning castes but yeah just to conclude um uh, this may seem extremely binaristic and i can see uh, the irony in that but really there's a lot of complexity that's going on and it's not merely a story of dominant caste versus oppressed caste really what we see is a function of both caste identity and land ownership and there are exceptions to the most simplistic narrative that i uh, just described where we see that access and power over land becomes one of the major determinants and we see that even in the transformation to urbanization caste is adapting so it's a little naive to think that i you can either leave your caste behind by going to the city or by the city coming to you because so much of what's happening is happening along um, existing socio economic structures and because we we are trying to argue that caste is really one of the defining uh, forces in um, these communities and these societies and these settlements so really we want to leave you with this idea that uh, um, there's a lot of interesting research happening in this field and it's important for any urban researcher here to be focusing very strongly on caste and to treat it as more than an added aspect of identity but really as a structuring force within um, indian settlements and indian society yeah that's all thank you thank you very much um uh, bhagavanidhi and andrew uh, from that work and the question that i want to leave you got for you later on uh, in our discussion um you know i think there's a very interesting parallel here again about the importance of spatiality and the spatial footprint of social social identity um uh, you know in the were talked about but does reinscribing a certain identity in space locating and fixing people to a particular place of land and in some way here we are seeing the difference in how the location within the cherry alters your ability to participate in the transformation and i wanted to think but at the same time you draw our attention to the importance of titling given the early fact that at least many dalit families within this cherry entered into the transformation as landholders so i do want you to reflect in some way between both the presentations of these sort of multiple roles that property is seeming to play right enabling certain restraining us in certain ways trapping us in place in certain ways but yet also securing us in certain ways because one thing i was thinking about is the counterfactual um that you know one of the difficulties in studying transformation is that we don't know the families who are no longer in these villages after period of movements right so i'm thinking also particularly that was the ability to have some small land holding also enabled you to remain right because how does one do the ethnography of absence in transformation um and i think it would be really interesting to just think a little bit a little bit more reflections on the role of titling and property in these navigations of how caste is then shaping and being shaped through um transformation um and and thank you very much for that so our next presentation is vrishali and i will hand over to her thanks sir uh, hello and good morning uh so yeah 
so this research deals mainly with the bhumiyars who are an important upper sub caste in northern india and formed one of the most uh, dominant and influential communities in they have been zamindars the biggest land owners here historically so i'll just skim through the first few slides the major concern of the study is to show how historical cultural ideological and psychosocial subjugation of lower caste becomes an important way of gaining power and maintaining dominance for upper caste irrespective of their spatial location the research uses uh, the ethno history methodology and attempts to establish a dialogue with both the structural and the narrative approaches in studying caste so as is argued in the case of the anavel brahmins in gujarat by jan brimen there is a significant in the pattern instrumental in the society and in the economy which is quite evident in their employment patterns cropping patterns and agricultural practices and in the relations of the tenants and the laborers with them thus the local demands have started working in tandem with the global ones in the present socio economic scenario with increased migration to the cities and the inroads of a free market system in the arguably persisting feudal realities so it was not just the pa uh, patrons control over land and livelihood of most of the clients but primarily the religious and cultural sanction afforded to his caste status which enabled him to make the relationship lopsided and highly unequal and exploitative by coercing the client to obtain for himself payments and services in excesses and way beyond those required of the client in exchange for the amount which was usually paid in kind so responses indicate that till date the capitalist system of paying for services is not something that the bhumiyas condone when instead they can get their work done and obtain services for free only by using their upper caste status this now this also serves uh, another twin purpose of symbolically reasserting their authority by getting it reaffirmed and confirmed on an everyday basis by the lower caste recognition of their overlordship and patronage thus the lower caste client is left with the task of providing caste specific services both religious and secular the situation has only worsened despite the alleged inroads of capitalism as even the minimum wages are now denied uh to the lower caste laborers in the name of continuing exploitative system such as the jajman and capitalist exploitation and traditional exploitation now go hand in hand so the nodal shifts in power rapidly happening after mandalization and still going on bringing in newer educational and employment opportunities to lower caste the disintegration of the isolation of the caste system due to better rural urban connectivity and the land reforms of the previous century have certainly crippled the system responses show that this is resented by the urban bhumiyas mostly now while certain well to do families of the upper caste upon gaining uh, upon gaining class ascendancy have moved to the glam of a city life they have in no way uprooted themselves from the socio cultural context of living in a village the hazards of monetary extraction of services is lessened or mitigated in the city by invoking or calling upon the kameen that is the client to send one of their children to work for them as to up, uh, so as to obtain services in exchange for a meager sum of money which is much less than what they would have to pay for a maid working in a city now information asymmetry plays a major role in this since the kameens never know the city prices for the same labor and remain under ignorance throughout their lives because it is the first generation for many families which has ever set foot outside of the village now once the judgment realizes that the child has grown enough to acquire information and talk back they fire them in fear of crimes and choose and target another family in the village so land readily gets translated into not just an asset but a status symbol as also a reminder of their roots and historic past findings have shown that within the bhumiyar community such examples abound wherein there is a constantly developing education gated class of urban dwelling upper middle class bhumiyars which constantly wants to distance itself from such beliefs and identities all while endorsing and even exploiting caste and caste based ties if necessary 
so on the element of untouchability and if it is still prevalent and practiced by the bhumiyas one of the respondents related an incident that he had gone to the fees thrown by a lower caste and his community members told him off saying that he would be outcasted or excommunicated now these are very common examples most respondents point at a harmony in the previous fiscal order when the lower caste laborers and clients fared a decent living for themselves due to the benevolence of the jajman bhumiyas of the earlier times totally ignoring the perilous sides to the ties that held them together and and the exploitative angle to the entire arrangement so the study findings also showed two startling paradoxes uh firstly while on the one hand the bhumiyas justify the continuation of their dominance on historical grounds on the other they attempt to make meaning of their lived experiences uh by spinning up a victim yarn for themselves and claiming that their weakening economic domination and constant stigmatization by other castes have led to their weakening socio cultural domination too especially with the rise of the obcs secondly even though they claim to move away from land ownership and hence the caste embracing mindset in arguing that with the onset of modernity and democratization of land and labor their control have lost their charms to them the narratives emanating from the lower uh, end of the spectrum point otherwise now this societal control in turn continues with or uh, even without uh, economic dominance in some peculiar cases and irrespective of an urban or rural location of the individual so this uh, these evidences point on the importance and continuing validation of their structural location in the caste hierarchy by themselves and their others it is widely held by the community that spatial dislocation due to migration from villages in bihar has somehow weakened their affinity for caste associations such as the great denial of the city dwelling uh, modern bhumiyas in practice they often dismiss the relevance that caste identities hold in their thought processes which are which often manifest themselves uh in everyday lives of the city dwelling bourgeoisie caste based lobbying are again common phenomenon with increasing democratization of land the realms of business and politics are now also being targeted as new avenues of exercise of caste based power so in conclusion the previously dilly dally romance with the roots is being reimbibed and rekindled due to rising insecurities and fear of alienation from one's community especially by migrant urban bhumiyas this shows in the contradictory recorded responses of bhumiyas who tend to relate land control in agrarian rural settings as the only sites for the exercise of caste relations and claim their society to be casteless otherwise the impulse is to maintain capital economic or cultural control by always seeking uh, newer means to resurrect and justify the resurrection of power and to rationalize caste based dominance they pose a most serious threat to social justice today thank you thank you very much rishali and i and i really want to thank all three of our opening speakers for being so remarkably good and prescient about their time um uh, rishali what i would love to hear from you in in for my question for our later discussion is you're really pointing us to a very different kind of archive which is the sort of ways in which this dominant caste group understands um caste power and rationalizes it and story tells around it and builds this question and this duality of weakening power also framed as vulnerability in the time of a lot of transition around capital though and what's interesting is that a lot of the empirical data will actually tell us that a lot of this experience of vulnerability is empirically not true that it is not that that power is weakening it is not that the wages are transforming to that point so i'm really interested in if we could hear from you in in the in the time of the discussion a sense of this narrative a, a little deeper hearing of your primary material on how this kind of what you call this paradox of we victimization and power assertion what does it sound like discursively right because it's also you're telling us a narrative of being liberal and casteless quote and quote uh, by urban bhumihar so i think it would be very interesting to just get a sense of the richness of this so one can take that discursive um, archive and begin to see how these 
what seem like contradictions, but really are strategic pluralities, right? Which narrative do we tell about ourselves at what point? And what is the political end of this discourse, even before we see it materially? Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, let me move on now. Presenting on behalf of a set of authors is Kritharth Jha. Uh, Kritharth, over to you. Thanks so much, Gautam. Um, and thank you all for staying for this presentation on residential segregation and local public services in India. This is joint work with Anjali Adukia, Sams Asher, Paul Novasad, Brandon Dan, and myself. And before we get into this, uh, I would really like to motivate why what we're studying is important. And one of the reasons for that is that location is an important determinant of opportunity. Uh, why? Because many drivers of development are highly localized, schools, labor markets, etc. However, any question around location needs data at a very high spatial resolution. Um, in many rich countries, for example, segregation is a very studied topic. Um, outside of those countries, it's barely studied because you need data at such a high resolution. In India, as we know, most of the analysis that we have, um, thanks to the national sample surveys, are done at the level of the district. So if you have to answer these questions, you need uh, a data set with, a, uh, with the low granularity that lets you answer these questions. So what we do in this paper is we have matched neighborhoods across two large censuses, and this lets us describe at a very high spatial resolution uh, what segregation and settlement patterns look across India, what the public good provision across these neighborhoods are. And again, we do this for about 1.6 million neighborhoods in India. And um, this, this data set lets us answer questions uh, around location, right? So what kind of data do we need exactly? Well, we use two main uh, data sets. The first one is the socioeconomic caste census. This, the SECC uh, uh, lets us uh, look at the demography of a neighborhood. So the SEC records uh, the SC status, and it also has names, which we transliterate, train, and classify as Muslim or non-Muslim. The other data set that we need for this analysis is uh, uh, information on government education and health facilities, which the Economic Census 2013 lets us do. And again, since both of them use the same unit of neighborhood, the enumeration block, we're able to match these across censuses. And all of this is done at a high spatial resolution of about 500 people. And before I move on to the paper and the results here, uh, I must plug uh, our uh, open data uh, product, the Shrug. Um, this is started out as a project to match censuses across uh, different rounds. And now many people have used it and different sectors of the economy have also been added onto this. Again, this is at a very high resolution at the village and town level. Um, and we have even more coming uh, in the next iteration of the Shrug. Um, so please feel free to um, go on Dev Data Lab and access the Shrug and contribute uh, if you want to. Okay, so now what do we start with, right? Let us start by characterizing what segregation looks like in India, right? And how do we measure that? We use it, measure it by using the dissimilarity index, which is zero if there's no segregation and one if there's complete segregation. And we calculate dissimilarity separately for SCs and Muslims. And again, we don't make any causal claims here. All of our results are descriptive, but we think that's still informative. So the first graph that I want to show you is uh, a density graph of um, uh, uh, segregation across India. And what you can see is from the blue graph, you can see that the SC discrimination uh, dissimilarity is much higher uh, than the Muslim dis dissimilarity in red. If you were wondering whether, and I'm showing you dissimilarity densities in urban neighborhoods. If you were wondering if that looks different in rural areas, um, not really. It's quite similar in both rural and urban areas. Here as well, SC dissimilarity densities are much higher than Muslim dissimilarities. If you wanted to look at a geographic scale, uh, the SC dissimilarity is high across India without any observable patterns. For Muslims, 
Um, it's similar, although you, one might say that uh, in the east of the country, there's slightly more dissimilarity segregation, um, but it, there are high pockets across the country. Another fact is that if you looked at when uh, the age of a city measured by the first year it appeared in a population census town directory, you'd see that a city uh, established in the 2000s, for example, has a lower dissimilarity than one in the late 1900s, uh, though not by that much. And this is true whether you look at the SC segregation or the Muslim segregation or dissimilarity. Within a district, uh, what we see is that if you plotted uh, the rural dissimilarity against the urban dissimilarity, you'd find that um, high rural segregation has higher uh, urban segregation as well. And this is within a district that we're looking at. Okay, so now we've seen what segregation looks like across the country, right? But at a very local level, how does it affect people's lives, right? What, and so to look at this, we look at the neighborhood marginalized group share, and we see uh, its effect on three outcomes, mainly the provision of public education and health facilities, and the education attainment of children in those neighborhoods. So let's look at this bin scatter of uh, neighborhoods and the probability of that neighborhood having a secondary school. So if you, if you look at the second graph where you have the Muslim share of a neighborhood on the x-axis, what you'll find is if the Muslim share of a neighborhood goes from 10% to 70%, for example, uh, you'll find that the probability of having a neighborhood goes from about, uh, of, uh, of that neighborhood having a secondary school goes down from about 2.4% to somewhere around 0.17%, 1 1.7%. Uh, so if you got the slope here, you'd see that it's, it's downward sloping, and we can represent those slopes across public goods as a coefficient plot. And what these coefficient plots tell us is that if you look at, say, rural Muslim neighborhoods, on average, um, you know, in rural areas, Muslim neighborhoods have 25% uh, you know, fewer schools and health facilities. Uh, SC neighborhoods uh, have it slightly better, um, although even in, if you look at urban areas, you see that uh, you know, these disparities are replicated. Of course, uh, there are some uh, exceptions to this uh, as well. So now we've seen that you know, high uh, marginalized group neighborhoods um, have lower public good facilities, but you might be wondering, do these neighborhoods experience worse outcomes? And our best measure for this is to look at the education of children in those neighborhoods, controlling for parent uh, characteristics. So here we run the regression of uh, the, the children's education, controlling for parent characteristics. And what we find is that if you were in a Muslim neighborhood, um, you know, depending on which categories, uh, child you are, uh, on average, um, you know, you'd experience about five to 10% fewer years of education um, if you were in a Muslim neighborhood than if you were not. Um, SC neighborhoods, as seen by the blue dots here, also uh, have about, uh, you know, slightly lesser education for uh, SCs and Muslims in SC neighborhoods, um, but uh, the story is less uh, clear there uh, than Muslim neighborhoods. Another lens to look at these disparities. So, so far we've been looking at one cross section in time because we had two data sets around roughly the same time. Another lens is uh, through time that we can look at this, these uh, results. And we, while we don't have neighborhood data across time, we do have census data at the village level and using uh, economic census data from 2005 and 2013, we can see that you know, these, these disparities have been there for a while. For health, uh, you know, it's probably the same, slightly getting better for uh, education for Muslim neighborhoods. But for SC neighborhoods as well, we can see that these disparities have persisted at least for the, uh, through the last decade. Okay, 
So what have we seen so far, right? Like in this presentation, I, um, we've motivated that location, your neighborhood where you stay is very important um, in, in many ways. And using two linked censuses, we can see how segregation patterns look across India. Um, and um, we can look at public good provision in some of these neighborhoods and look at what uh, consequences that may have. Um, and uh, that's my presentation. Thank you all so much for being with me. Thanks a lot, Pitha. It's, um, it's, it's a relief to hear someone say about Indian data sets that you were able to match two entirely different data sets because we know that our data sets seem to be designed precisely to never be in the same room at the same time. They're like Schrodinger's like table. Um, so I wanted to actually, you know, I'm thinking a little bit of methodologically about this. So two questions from me. Uh, brief. One is within the method, you know, one of the things that's always struck me about an empirical measure of segregation is at what scale you do it. Because if you have three neighborhoods of 500 people next to each other, each neighborhood is completely homogenous by identity. At neighborhood scale, you have a very segregated um, spatiality. But those neighborhoods share cheek by jowl, live next to each other, and then share common space in the middle. I'm basically describing large parts of Mumbai, right? The entirely Gujarati building, the entirely Tamil building, the entirely Muslim building, but they all share the compound and the festivals are jointly celebrated. So the buildings don't mix, but the compound mixes. So at what scale do we start empirically saying, look, this is segregated? Because segregation at ward level and neighborhood level and district level are very different. And so I'm just thinking a little bit about the scalar question within the method. And the second thing I'd love actually to hear from you is idea, you know, we're talking about, um, in there we talked about the social life of property. And I'm kind of thinking a little bit about the social life of segregation, right? When you see the three presentations that have come before you, that have very different methodological and scalar ways of thinking about what segregation does. How do you see these two methods speaking to each other, right? How do we speak both across these large scale dissimilarity indexes? But then this nuance of, you know, the peri-urban village in Bangalore, where there was land titling by a 1985 policy, and therefore the transformations are different. You know, this is that old question between the particular and the general, and how do we hold one without losing the other? But I'm particularly interested in methods that combine large empirical analysis with ethnographic sensibilities, with grounded particularities, with contextual uh, political economy. So just thoughts about you know, if you were to push this data beyond it, like how do we use this data ethnographically? How do ethnographers use it? You know, how do you take it now? Do people take it from each other? So we can talk across methods and not just arguments. But thank you so much for that. It's really nice to see a very different scale and, and thinking about it. All right, our next paper is by Sophia Islam um, and I will hand over to her now. Sophia. Hi, hey, good morning, everyone. I'm sharing my screen. My presentation is titled Reclaiming Public Life in Delhi's Urban Villages, and it is part of my capstone project, which was done during my Master of Urban Design program at SEPT University. Just to give a brief idea of what the presentation is going to take you through, so I'll start with a brief introduction of urban villages in Delhi, and followed by a case study of Khosrani village, and then finally concluding with a strategy idea of how we can really transform these villages. So Delhi is also known as a city of cities. Over the centuries, a lot of people have occupied the seat of political power in the city, and therefore it has continued to transform. And in fact, it is continuing to transform even today, but in a, in a, in a lot of different ways. You've seen a lot of protests by women saying that public spaces need to be accessible to women, need to be freely accessible to women. And at the same time, the architecture of the city and the transportation of the city have been evolving with time. Another notable change which has happened in the city is that now privatized public spaces have started gaining identity as the new safe public places in the city. One of the examples is the picture here of Cinec City Walk Mall, which is a prime location in the city and people from all over Delhi and CR come and visit this place. Few new places which are now coming up in the city are mostly uh, located in the peripheries of urban villages. Champagali is one such example, which is located in an urban village in Delhi. 
and another one is Chapur Jat, which has transformed into a hub of fashion stores. So the point here to make is that these urban villages are housing approximately 8 lakh people as per the master plan of Delhi 2021. And these urban villages have already started making use of their uh, of the potential of their location and therefore they are transforming into such hubs of fashion stores and cafes where the people can go to and experience the uh, peripheries of these villages. So to put in perspective the idea of the term urban village and a brief history of how it has really evolved. Uh, during the British uh, rule on India, the, uh, the uh, villages which were known as Abadi areas at that time were circumscri circumscribed by a red ink and they came to be known as Lalura for the purposes of revenue generation. And as the city started reaching towards these, they were engulfed into the city's development and came to be known as urban villages. At the same time, a peripheral road was constructed around them to curb their lateral expansion. And at the same time, they were also uh, exempted from the regulations of the buildings uh, within the city. So uh, to conclude on the situation of urban villages that I'm trying to look at through this particular project, the absence of regulations and the community land ownership put together has led to a situation where only the peripheries of the urban villages have transformed and there's no integration of these villages with the city which makes them like a dense uh, non-porous entity an unplanned entity in the city which has no connection with the surroundings really and therefore the peripheries do transform into places where people can go to but the interiors really remain concealed and the residents struggle for a basic quality of of life within these villages. So a case study was picked up through this project, the Hosrani village, which lies in the South Delhi district. And the reason why this becomes a relevant case study is because of its prime location and the intersection of all the issues that I just pointed out through the presentation. So it lies right across the Select City Walk Mall, which is one of the largest privatized public spaces in the city. It lies along the Press Enclave Road, which is a major road that connects Delhi to Gurgaon and therefore a lot of traffic. And that is why the edges of this village show a diversity of uses which are in response to the surrounding neighborhoods around it. And that is how this case study was picked up and this becomes relevant to understand the intersection of all the issues which were pointed out earlier. So the study started by understanding the history of this village and how it came to be developed into the current situation. So the local inhabitants started settling in in the 12th century across Hazirani. With the development of the Kirki Mosque, Muslim dominant population came into the village. And slowly with the development of residential colonies, the immigrant labor started settling in. So a diversity, a mix of communities started happening within the village. And in 2006 and 2007, with the development of Max Hospital and Select City Walk, two major commercial centers, the village become, became a possible affordable housing location for the people who came to be treated in Max Hospital, and it continues to be so. And also the people who were already living, the residents in the Hosrani village became a source of labor for the Select City Walk Mall. And slowly with the development of Malvinagar Metro Station, a heavy pedestrian footfall is also seen on this uh, road and therefore a pedestrian overbridge came about in 2020, which enabled the connection across the road. But the village throughout this remains concealed and really even if we walk on this road, we we would never realize that there's such a space lying right across such uh, prominent commercial centers in the city. These are few images along the Press Enclave Road. And through this, what I'm trying to point out towards is the diversity of uses along the edge. So there are pottery shops, which is one of the ancestral uh, crafts in the village. There are pharmacies across the hospital. There are food outlets across the mall. But then as soon as you go inside, it's a stark contrast. The lanes are dark and shady. There's no proper light and ventilation. Wayfinding is an issue in the village. But then at times these lanes reach to such open spaces, which are a much needed relief. And public life seems to be happening somehow. So it seems to be existing somehow in these open spaces. 
but they really they are really not developed to cater to the type of quality of life that people in delhi would really need and to quantify all of this this is the built density the open spaces are mostly consolidated towards the edge towards the present clay road and within the interiors there are barely few open spaces which are mostly located close to landmark religious or institutional buildings only so the strategy idea started to you know explore the social and spatial concerns within the village and this is an attempt to understand if an urban design transformation can try and resolve the spatial issues and therefore create an opportunity to resolve the social issues of the community within this village so the strategy started with identifying the peripheral uh, buildings and the mix of uses which can be redeveloped and the surrounding road can be restructured to enable a smooth traffic movement throughout the periphery of the village without really disturbing the interiors and further these landmarks which are seen in different colors within this uh, graphic these are landmarks where public life is currently already happening and there are small commercial centers developing around this so the strategy says that what if we develop spaces around these landmarks just to enable the already public life which is there just to enable space for that public life to really happen and then developing connections which can integrate this pub, these public spaces to the city as well so the attempt here is to create a similar uh, structure which is already happening on the peripheries and has already started happening in these landmarks but the idea here is to uh, increase the amount of activity happening in these spaces and further to connect them to the city therefore making the village porous legible improving the way finding because these connections are really connecting the landmarks to the city and they become as natural way finding measures in the village and once this space is created and the next question which arises is what do we really uh, how do we really ensure that the right functions happen and by right i mean to say that in order to create more livable and inclusive communities how do we decide what functions to put in where and why so which is why place making becomes an important aspect of this strategy and these functions can be identified based on the current functions happening within the village with a focus on creating more inclusive neighborhoods these are few visuals of what the village can look like and through these i would just like to point to the fact that the development needs to happen in such a way that it is grounded and the design should not really create a contrast for the people living in the village rather it should be something which is which comes out from the people and which really connects them to the identity of the village which they already have so to conclude in terms of the way ahead the question that came to my mind was how do we really ensure such a development can happen and i feel that the first step to that is creating a democratic way of working where a committee can be set up in terms of the broad planning and strategizing and another committee for the detailed design and implementation and all of the stakeholders can come together they can they can uh, get the community to involve into it and therefore the design can be unique in the perspective that it starts from the residents and then it grows out to reach towards the city so just to conclude the approach here says that we should start from the inside out rather than from the city to the village we should go from the village to the city the strategy idea should be rooted such that the people of the village really feel connected to it and they are the people who benefit from it first and slowly this can grow and integrate the village with the city therefore ensuring that the people of the village experience the city as much as the people outside the village are really doing thank you thanks sophia thanks and again you know i think th thinking you know again in terms of the diversity of methods and practices and it's you know to think of a design entry point into spaces that are so deeply socially and spatially constructed um is really 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 nice to think now differently of this way from the data so the the push that i want to give you a little bit sophia is to ask you you know I, this this is my neighborhood i mean i i live across the street from hazrani so i have spent many many years inside it and um and i want to think a little bit 
think about something you said about the design not feeling like a contrast to the residents, right? This idea that it should not be like that. But when you were showing the images of the renders, my first instinct was contrast. My first instinct was that even this way of designing those spaces, right? You know, we all struggle with the way in which those drawings get rendered, right? It's very hard to hold on to it. But I think all of us who've thought about design interventions have struggled with this, that one says that there should not be contrast. But how does one take an organically grown built environment, intervene in it through specifically through design and then not anticipate contrast? Where are the examples of that that looks like? How do we begin to think of the language differently of this terms of question? Make, for example, the question on wayfinding. Um, you know, everyone I know in Hazrani knows exactly how to find their way around it. So the wayfinding is a problem for me who comes into the village, right? Where is, it's not a problem for residents. So I also want to think a little bit about when we talk about strategy and intervention, what is the question we're trying to answer? What is the problem we're setting up as trying to solve? And where is that coming from? Because when you talk about the quality of the interior infrastructure of the village, then clearly that's also articulated locally, right? Hazrani is very politically active with its MLA, arguing precisely about its infrastructural neglect. But I do want to think about also one way in which that protect the settlement. You could also tell the story you told that regardless of the massive redevelopment of that road, Hazrani has retained and not gentrified. It has retained its commerce, it has retained its residents. So the same story can also be told about a story of resilience. And I just want to think about what the kind, the language you used of integrating the village into the city, what does it do to the resilience of it being able to absorb Max Hospital and the development without getting priced out and gentrified and redeveloped out of that area, right? So how do we think also about um, resilience um, from this story of Hosrani and not just neglect, right? How do we think a little bit about what has enabled it to survive all these layers of changes around it? And what kind of improvement and redevelopment would not just allow it to be better for residents infrastructurally, which absolutely has to happen, but also would not expose it to then its ability to resist the changes and integration, right? This is also a neighborhood that's trying not to get pulled into the city when the city across the road from it is large private development um, through private and public uh, big land parcel infrastructure, right? So we keep a certain sense of protection. And this is true, not just of informal settlements, but of informal labor, for example, right? Formalization and integration too quickly also comes at a cost, not just in terms of gain. So how do we think about that balance, right, in terms of how neighborhoods change? I want to thank all of you, actually, for, for really being able to use what time we had with, with such rigor and discipline. Um, and I, you know, I, I want to close very sharply in a minute because our next panel begins at 11.30. Um, but I wanted to just reflect a little bit on the opening question that we talked about on not just thinking about the social as a reflection of the urban itself, as opposed to a site um, or a particular kind of archive or a set of relations that follow space or follow the economic or follow the political but actually produces the space. And to think that all these papers have given us ways to really substantiate and illustrate what that looks like in very different ways across very different registers. Um, and to also suggest, again, I think one of the things that I think often when I'm, um, when, when one chairs a panel is, what would it mean if all of these projects were done by us as a collective, right? What would the, because then in a single proposal, we would have to reconcile our methods the large scale, uh, you know, the large scale structural and spatial histories, the discursive shifts, the changes in actual land ownership in path the, ch the intentional changes in design environment versus organic growth, the questions of state policy and practice. And I think it's a very useful thought experiment um, to often take our own inquiries and lace them with the methods and inquiries of people who are asking similar questions to us, but in very different sites. And I think that sort of changes the way in which we look at our own archives and is the beginning of some, um, will thicken our way of looking at the urban through the social 
in a way that we are not relegated to be uneconomic or un aspatial or uninstitutional, which is, I think, um, a very unfortunate divide that has come through in many places. So that when economists talk about the land market, they talk about a land market, like Andrew Nidhi was saying, as socially constituted through capital being transformed through caste, which is linked to the spatial transformations at the periphery. So I think these layerings are pivotal. Um, and thank you all so much for offering us um, the density of archives that you have given to us to think about the social in different ways. And I really hope we keep reading across these different archives and really see these papers not as separate provocations from independent field sites, but actually a joint question um, about uh, ways of reading the urban. Um, and, uh, and with those snaps that Indra has given us, we will close. And just a reminder that the next panel is at 11.30, which is on livelihoods and work. Um, and I think it's going to be a very exciting set of papers chaired by my colleague Aditi Suri. So see you all in about 20 minutes. Thank you all very much to the presenters. Everyone, please stay safe where, where you are. Um, and we will now um, go back to the banner that ends this uh, session. Thank you all very much. Take care.